as I was exploring this new field of interpersonal neurobiology, which is a name for what it's the name that Daniel Siegel has given to this confluence of professions of cognitive neuroscience, social neuroscience, attachment research, child development research, complexity theory, psychology, psychiatry, it all comes together. And, wh and how do these fields inform one another? What, do we, what have we started to learn about neuroplasticity, about the way that the brain actually changes? Uh, so Matthew Lieberman at UCLA was putting people into MRI machines and showing them pictures of faces that had extreme emotion on them. And when he showed them pictures of faces with extreme emotion, he could see that their emotional alarm center would go off in deep, deep in the brain. So if we think about the brain, if we think about the, the arm as a model of the brain, then the, the wrist and the forearm are the spinal column coming up to the brain stem, the part of the brain that keeps us alive when we're in a coma and does that automatic regulation. And then folding a thumb across, that represents the deep structures of the brain, the limbic system. And this is where we have all of our emotion and bonding and memory. This is these centers right here. And then as we put our fingers down over, then we see sort of the traditional view of the brain with the bumpy outer cortex. And what happens is that we're hardwired for this little emotional alarm center to take control if there's any kind of danger. So when that takes control, it's, it, the brain doesn't actually move, but it's like we flipped our lid. We can see in the MRIs that the prefrontal cortex stops working when people get upset. And then Matthew Lieberman was wondering, how do we get ourselves calm again? So he had the people in the MRI name um, the person that they were seeing. That's Edwin, that's Sarah. Nothing changed when they named the name. He had them name the gender. That's a man, that's a woman. But nothing changed. And then he had them name the emotion they were seeing. That's terror, that's grief. And when he did that, what he saw was that the amygdala activation fell by half and the prefrontal cortex started to come online, this part of the brain that we know is responsible for empathy and mindsight. So this part of the brain, the prefrontal cortex then, is our NBC brain or our empathy brain, and it's the kind of, it's the brain we want to be in relationship with. It's the brains of others that we fall in love with. It's the brains of others that we marry. And then all of a sudden, as we move deeper into relationship, there are all these alarm signals and people stop being their full self until there's some sort of, as you have, a culture of empathy, both in partnerships and friendships and society. As we begin to introduce this culture of empathy, what we're really having as a result is brains that are actually fully present, able to contribute all of their wisdom and knowledge and care. So then the key thing, really, that gets us from, from here to here, there are two key things. One of them is simple identification, so naming the feeling that we have. And if it's grief, then it needs to be named rather than anger. If we name it as anger but it's grief, then nothing happens. Mm -hmm. <laughs> we might get more irritated. Or uh, what? And what is that? Um, the, the need takes us into some other research that I'll go into in just a moment. But the other thing that happens with empathy is that we're really capturing um, a resonant understanding of one another. And that is the thing that creates the most calming um, effect for us, is this sense of being deeply gotten, of really being understood. That's what transforms um, our lives from being run by panic and anxiety into a kind of a relaxed state where we get to be creative and expressive. 